Farias. Uh, yeah, I'm Gerard Farias. I'm the faculty at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and one of the, uh, along with Arya and Jyoti and Akhil, uh, organizers of this uh, of this series called Responsible Digital Futures. So, uh, who would like to go next? Or should I call out from my screen, Arya? Sure. Uh, well, you introduced me uh, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> so I am uh, part of EMA. I also am a career director at NYU Courant for a master's program. And um, I love photography. And um, I am seeing a lot of challenges with um, digital technology. So um, uh, great to have Max here. Thank you. Abby? Hi everyone, I'm Abby Schneider. I'm a marketing professor at Regis University in Denver, Colorado. Um, and a lot of my research with my colleagues, Sunaina Chigani and Jason Stornelli, who are here, um, is about how we can use social media more wisely in order to enhance individual, interpersonal, and societal well being. So, really excited to be here. Thank you. Matthew? Uh, my name is Matthew Erickson. I'm a professor and chair of the management department at Providence College. I uh, teach self leadership classes, and a lot of focus, you know, ends up being on well being and um, the impact of technology on them, like even within the classroom and then outside of it. So, very interested in this topic and the impact on students in their lives, anxiety, and their learning. Okay, Jyoti. Jyoti is one of the co organizers of this. Thank you, Jyoti Bachani, Professor of Strategy, Management of Technology and Innovation at St. Mary's College of California in the San Francisco Bay Area, but currently joining from India. Thanks. Erica, I think we're right, I mean, we're 17 people, so we'll do this as quickly as possible. Erica, please. Hi, it's Erica calling in from Paris. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm associated with EMA, of course, and I'm at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and with the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Entrepreneurship. Super excited for today. Thank you. Sunaina? Hi, Assistant Professor of Marketing at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and I'm also working um, with Abby and Jason on interventions to improve social media well-being. Thank you. Jason? I'm Jason Stornelli. I'm an Associate Professor of Marketing at Oregon State University, and Broadly, I study self-regulation, um, and uh, for, for this meeting, uh, I'm working on uh, social media wisdom with, uh, with Abby and Sunaina. Thank you. Uh, Sunaina, the screens have moved, so if I repeat names, pardon me for that, Blanca? He, he has a note in the chat. Okay. Or she... uh, yeah. Why, why don't Why don't we go to the chat now? I'm sorry for those are, who have got left out, but I think the numbers are growing bigger than than I can handle uh, with this. So, so let's start off with, uh, you know, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's session is part of the Responsible Digital Futures uh, uh, series, and we hope to continue conversations on how digital technologies can be employed responsibly, generating benefits without harm. Today, we focus on the impact of social media on the youth and the young people in our lives. While social media and its growth seems inevitable, we need strategies to minimize harm. And the most important place to start, I think at least, is our youth and our young people. So I want to welcome Max Stossel. Max, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Max is an award-winning artist, and I just found out that he's just won an award for uh, for a film. I don't know the full details, so maybe that can come up later. Uh, but uh, for his work, for his artistic work, uh, and he's in New York right now. He's the founder of Social Awakening, an organization dedicated to helping young people survive and thrive in the modern world and the Youth and Education Advisor for the Center for Humane Technology, a group working to realign technology with humanity. For those of you uh, who attended the last session, uh, we that was focused on, on the film Social Dilemma, and uh, so, so been very active, and I, there's a lot of connection between EMA and, this, and I think the whole idea of the humanistic use of technology. So I think this is really, really important for us. 
Uh, Max has spent the last seven years speaking with 100,000 plus students, parents, and educators around the world about social media's impact on our lives, creating resources to help manage that impact. Max provides a unique and much needed perspective on the role of technology in our homes, school, and society. And I guess all of us have experienced that. Uh, so uh, Max, have I left anything out? Would, would you like to add anything to that introduction? I like long walks on the beach and <laughs> dogs at night. It's perfectly great. It's great to be here. Thank <laughs> you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to ask Max a few questions to start with, and then we'll open it up to, to a larger conversation and questions from anyone who would like to raise them. Please make use of the chat if, if, you, if you feel that's appropriate. We are a small enough group so we can, you know, we can get into a conversation. So I thought, Max, if we could just start with the big picture, uh, right? What got you concerned about the impact of social media on young people? And why did you feel the need to develop interventions to address this impact? So yeah, I started uh, you know, helping Tristan start the Center for Humane Technology. I guess that was about eight years ago now. Um, that was after working in tech and realizing that we were making decisions that weren't necessarily aligned with the people who were using our products. And I thought Tristan articulated that so beautifully. And then in starting to work with him, we were getting all these emails from parents and teachers and some students pretty much saying, what the heck do we do about this whole smartphone and social media thing as it was invading their lives and their worlds? Um, and I thought maybe my perspective can be helpful. And I started just going into give like presentations, assemblies at schools, where I, instead of being a parent saying like, you kids and your phones, rah, 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 are trying to play tug of war, I was able to come back, come in and say, look, let me show you how some of this is designed because it's really not on your team. So you can make your own decisions about how, how to navigate some of this stuff. Um, and that was just like a helpful starting point for a lot of schools and communities to not be fighting each other, but to all recognize that we're up against something that's really hard to deal with and how do we do that? Um, and yeah, and I, I leaned in um, to that and I've spoken with, with a whole lot of folks over the past, uh, over the past decade about this. And the things I'm seeing that make me concerned are probably first and foremost, the mental health numbers, especially among teenage girls, like 10 to 14, especially, but really 10 to 18 and boys and girls. Um, I think like, and I'm, there are pieces like that. It's never been easier to run away from ourselves. And I think young people like literally are not having the spaces where they need to learn how to deal with boredom, how to deal with loneliness, like how to overcome the more challenging emotions that we just face on a regular basis and used to have to learn how to cope with. Now we have the safety blanket that we carry around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's never been easier to run away from ourselves. And so a big proponent of what I try to push for in schools is to integrate like away for the day phone policies where you have this opportunity of eight hours during the day as kids are developing to learn, focus, patience, how to be without your devices and just how to like sort of forcibly overcoming some of the social development and uh, hurdles that are that are there. Where I'm seeing like, I had a kid ask me, if, why aren't there classes on eye contact? Um, which is new, like that's not something we used to have to think about. Um, but I don't think the social development is happening in quite the same way that it used to. And I think smartphones and social media especially are responsible for that. So I'm very concerned about like the depression, anxiety and self-harm and suicide rates. Um, and ultimately like life is beautiful. And I'm concerned that most kids are missing that because it's been taken over by the system. Thank you. Uh, so you could you give us uh, an idea of what exactly you do with, uh, with these sessions that I know you conduct sessions at schools and talk to so so what what a kind of uh, idea of what what happens in those sessions sure um so yeah, the way we usually do it is like i'll come into a community for a day i will work at the middle school then i'll speak with the high school like usually the educators around like lunchtime when we do that and i talk with the parents at night and then i leave them behind with like we've we're working with harvard they've started i'll hearing some of your interests, I'll definitely send or email me if you want me to send you these Harvard resources that they co-developed with teenagers that are to like try and create better conversations about social media and about how it's impacting our lives. It's like, I love, really love that they get into the human element. It's not just what's going on on the screens. It's like, what are you struggling with in your life? And then how does social media 
influence that or things like these thinking traps of, oh, you notice how online you get one negative comment and you're only thinking about that, not the positive ones, just like trying to really get into the human. But so afterwards, we share those resources, we share the best practices I outline in the presentations. The presentations themselves usually focus on like the first third being just examples of ways that social media is manipulative and like design by design and helping them recognize that in the room. And then we talk about some of the ways that like that's influencing the way we relate to each other, our friendships, just kind of like pointing out little details of how that's maybe you're showing up to uh, to an event, not because you actually want to be there, but because, just because you want to take a picture or how many of you are only getting in romantic relationships or staying in them to look hashtag blessed and hashtag in love on Instagram and on TikTok and like just starting those sort of different ways of thinking about things. And also like imagining if social media were a room, what would it look like if it were in real life? Sort of posting is making an announcement to a large group of people, but you can't actually see them. What might that be like trying to shift perspective on this thing that we're all kind of doing? Um, and then I share some stories from teenagers who have shared their struggles with social media. Um, and then we go into just over the years, some best practices that have emerged of ways of managing this stuff. And so the presentation really serves as an opportunity to shift perspective and change the way we're thinking about this stuff. Uh, and then trying to hit all sort of parties involved within a school that with a district or a community so that everyone can talk about it together and then giving them these resources and these like uh, PDFs to help continue that conversation. Um, sadly, I don't believe I can come in and solve anyone's problems with social media. I think that's a lifelong endeavor that we're working with here, but I've gotten very good over the years at that starting point of shifting the perspective and opening the conversation. Uh, and I was wondering what, what are, what are, how do how do the young people in particular respond and react to to the to the material you present to them and your work with them? Um, I would say the uh, that's where I've been able to really be be very valuable with this is that I'm able to come in when I look kind of young, um, and to come in not as a parent or a teacher, but come in as a like as someone in the industry and say, and I say right off the bat, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Like, and I'm not here to get into a war with you. I just want to show you how some of this stuff works so you can choose for yourself. And they've been very receptive to that. Um, oftentimes throughout the presentation, um, like the boys are very interested and then often the girls get very quiet. Like as we talk about the mental health challenges and, you know, I like, I show a video of a pizza being photoshopped into a woman in a bikini, like talking about body image and stuff like that. But I think a lot of these young girls, especially in middle schools and high schools, are dealing with just like a lot of self-comparison and like this, the same challenges that people have been going, going through over generations just with gasoline poured all over that fire. And um, but yeah, I think I've I think I've been able to be more uh, I've re been received better than most about this subject and trying to help open some eyes. Thank you. Uh, uh, what, uh, given the, the audience here and the title of of this series, uh, most of us are engaged in in teaching students who will eventually go to work in com uh, in some of them at least will go to work in companies that are engaged in digital technology in some way, and. Um, while we do address the question of ethics and practices and things like that, uh, watching what's happening in the world, uh, in the social media world, it doesn't seem like they have the power or can be empowered to, to actually make changes on the, on the source of this, on, on the companies that create social media. So um, I was wondering, do you have some advice for us about how to create greater awareness and consciousness of the impacts of these on on young people itself. That uh, from from the supplier side, is there is there something that you could see us doing? Um, I mean, self reflection is the angle that I have found to be most effective. Of like, I I appreciate the angle of hey, they're manipulating you as opposed to like, you know, what are you doing? I think it's just easier to fight against some like a bad guy who's manipulating us as opposed to like, oh, maybe this thing isn't so good for me. Maybe I should eat more vegetables. Um, and I think like, you know, asking questions in the room, like if you think back to 
like the most meaningful moments of your life, the times you were having the most fun, the times you were laughing the hardest, the times you felt most connected or just like in love, like what was social media's role in that? Like, was there any? Maybe there was sometimes, but there probably wasn't most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and can you can we recognize that in a world where there is no shortage of technology companies that are trying to steal your time all the time, and there are a lot of consequences for that, um, how do we design more of the experiences in our lives that feel fulfilling and good? And in terms of changing the platforms themselves, yeah, we you know, most of, I used to believe that Apple was going to save us or like Google was going to save us on these with having a marketplace that ranks things better. But I found talking to some people in those companies that, uh, that they really like, they just run into inertia. There are people who are fighting for stuff like this inside of the companies, but they like, they ultimately run up against a growth team or run up against numbers that are just not, it's like, Oh, if we were to make that change, that wouldn't be good for bottom line or if we want to really make that change so significantly that would be too bad for business why don't we compromise on it and then you just have these sort of half-baked answers and solutions so I, I really do think it would need to be like a different generation of tech product and that maybe the students that you're teaching will build and so what does that look like and I think inspiring them to think like on a human level what would a social network look like that is using all of its data to figure out how did I create more meaningful experiences in the real world that you later rate as meaningful? How did I connect you to people that like have supported your life on a human level in X, Y, and Z way? Not just like how many connections I made or not just um, like how long you spent on a platform, but did we help you live more boldly, courageously, creatively, whatever your values are, did we help with those? Like, are we on your team? And a social network like that just probably doesn't have very much of a feed it's like, unless you're coming in to, or to, to zone out, which wonderful, like if you're coming in with that attention, intention, you've got an incredible tool to do that. Um, but I think the next generation of social network would have to like look pretty cons considerably different and really be a social network. And that would be the type of thing I think that would make significant change if, if someone builds it and builds it well. Do you see any possibilities of that on the horizon? Is there, are there I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen many like companies thinking about it this way. Like it's so much easier to measure clicks and shares and screen time than it is to measure these human results and like the relationship required to measure these these human results. Um, and then I, I and it, this could really just be my ignorance of not being in the space closely enough. But like because I've much more been focused on the kids than I have been on the tech industry and what's coming up. But I haven't seen many companies that like are like a company we need to be obsessed with like how is this really influencing someone's life and really be like create trust in a way that people would actually want to tell them. Like if Facebook was all of a sudden like, yeah, we want to be good for people and we want to know how this is influencing your life. Here's a survey. I'd be like, mm, I don't think this is exactly where this data is going. And that trust is not there with that company. Mm -hmm. But if there was a new generation of company that was just foundationally built on that. I would be very open to that. And um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, like most of the things I've seen are still a kind of feed based and it's just sort of like a, they're trying to market themselves as like not as toxic social media, which great. I'm glad those are kind of popping up, but I would like something that is more foundationally different and more foundationally focused on humanity. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, that kind of stole my next question, which was, uh, you know, with Center for Humane Technology being active and other attempts at, at addressing these issues, uh, seems to be from what you said, there hasn't been really much significant change from the from the company so far. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I would say, you know, we're not we weren't solely responsible for these changes, of course, but like, you know, the, the things like the screen time limits that are popping up, that certainly can be found in some of Tristan's early work, or like the do not disturb features on Slack and respecting people's attention in those ways, sort of small feature differences. And then, of course, I'm very proud of the work with Center for Humane Technology, just in the amount of awareness that has come up about yeah. persuasive technology that we've done. And Tristan, to his credit, has really spearheaded this of just a massive shift in the number of people who are thinking and talking about this stuff. And so I think incredibly effective in that regard, in terms of shifting the, you know, the, the meaningfully shifting the companies. It's also, you know, looking back on it, 
Mark Zuckerberg integrated time well spent, which is what the movement was initially called, as his metrics for Facebook. It just he didn't actually make them mean anything close to what to what time well spent actually means. He was measuring time well spent as like videos instead of like text. It was just a total co-opting. And Elon Musk has recently like said, our new Twitter speech policy is freedom of speech does not equal freedom of reach, which is also something like AZA at the Center for Humane Technology had been saying for a long time. And so like the terminology and phrases are making their way into big tech. It's just sort of like, yeah, okay, but what that what does that mean? The devil's in the details. And I, I don't think we're aligned on on that piece. It seems more likely that these companies are using some of this stuff for PR as opposed to making the foundational changes. And I think they're such behemoths that it's pretty tough to it's pretty tough for them to sh to steer in like a really different direction. So I think incredible amounts of cultural change have come from that company. But yeah, in terms of actual shifts in the companies themselves, small changes, but not so much that is like deeply substantial in ways that I think Tristan or that org would really be satisfied with. Would 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 the change really be possible without a fundamental change in the business model itself? which is so uh, wedded to the notion of, of attention? Um, probably, um, yeah, probably not. Uh, it would probably have to be a shift of that nature. If it turned out that like 80% of, like the, a shift that would be healthy for someone required 80% less time on social media, the companies can't make that shift. That's just too much of a hit to the bottom line. So yeah, I think I think these next generations of companies would need to be have a different business model, and what that looks like is still to sort of be discovered. But I would certainly pay for a product that was actually using all that data to help me be the person I wanted to be and live by my values and enhance my social life in unimaginably meaningful ways. Like that, of course, feels valuable to me. I might even donate for other people to have that if it's really doing that. Um, but again, I don't trust. Facebook or Google, the, the companies that have been operating these other ways for years to suddenly shift and say, we're doing this now. I would be very skeptical of this at that. Okay. Uh, let me let me open it up for uh, for questions. And uh, I think I think the best way to do that, since we are uh, just 20 people here, uh, just raise your hands and I will I will call on you to uh, Ariane. Uh, okay. And I think Sunaina also had a hand up. Could we start yes. with Sunaina? Yes. go first. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Max, for all of that really um, illuminating. And I was curious, you said when you were working with the students, there are some best practices that you recommend on using social media. What are those best practices if it's not too much to get into? Um, sure. Uh, let me pull up some of them. Would you like to share screen? I can, we can. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Ariane, could you set that up? Uh, when you want for the students themselves, right? Yeah, whatever you Not do. You and, them. Okay, cool. Um, Columbia. Um, share screen. Um, so these are just like things I frame it as these are things people have been doing. They seem to be happy with doing these. Um, and so one is turning off any notification that's not from a human being trying to reach you. I go into details earlier in the presentation about how like on Snapchat, which is the number one messaging app for teenagers, they're like default notifications of this person is typing. Like you get a push notification that someone is typing to you, which is just like pretty next level of the amount of distraction back and forth. And so going into your notification settings and making it so your phone can only buzz if a person is trying to reach you. No, happy holidays from Tinder. You haven't played Candy Crush in a while. This person has liked your photo. Turning all of those off so your phone can only buzz if a person wants to get a hold of you. Um, and then, so this is especially for the young girls, like just Marie Kondoing your social media uh, accounts of on, like going through. And if anyone is making you feel deeply inadequate or uh, a lot of the fitness influencers and models just like unfollowing all those accounts. Sometimes people will send messages saying, oh, I feel so free after doing this. Um, or beating the Instagram algorithm, not to get more likes and followers, but the people who are happy with their use seem to be like much more actively engaging and training their algorithms. So like actively commenting and liking on certain content that you want to see more of, um, really using the unfollow and the mute buttons for things like that you don't want to be seeing a lot of. 
I always comment on how like this won't get rid of everything that is awful about these platforms, but the people who like are happier with their use tend to be much more actively engaging with the stuff they want to see more of um, to turn the algorithms that way. Uh, when talking about like deleting toxic apps, I always say, it's not necessarily saying these, tox these apps are toxic for you, but they're obviously toxic for a bunch of you. Um, and really important to think about the replacement behavior if you're doing this. Um, for If you tell a teenager to, to delete Snapchat, they'll look at you like you're out of your freaking mind because initially it sounds like you're saying, like, stop talking to your friends versus reiterating, no, 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 please use technology to talk to your friends. Please use it to talk to your friends. If you want to just maybe move the group chat and move the text over from this app that is manipulating you so intensely just to regular messaging apps or to WhatsApp or to whatever it might be. Um, with TikTok, we think of so many behaviors as all TikTok. We think of dancing, recording that dance, posting that dance into this self-comparison slot machine of how many likes did I get, viewing somebody's profile, all as TikTok. Those are all pretty different things. And so understanding, what do you like about this? Maybe you like making skits or making dance videos. Maybe you could do that, but you could text them to friends instead of posting it where then you're feeling inadequate and checking every five seconds of how many likes you got. Or maybe you really like one person's profile and the videos they make, but you want to avoid the news feed and go there directly. Just thinking a little bit more critically about how you're using these apps and what you're getting out of them. It is much easier to do this as groups than it is to do it as any kind of individual. Um, grab a friend always with this accountability buddies. It's no fun to be the only kid who's not um, who's not on a certain app. Um, just a lot of people love having a physical alarm clock, which are $8 on Amazon. Um, if you're using your phone as your alarm clock, your first thoughts of the day are not really your own. You wake up in the morning, you're groggy because you're a human being, and you're just like hit with all these Snapchat notifications or ways you're behind on your day, just all the stress immediately in your groggy brain. Physical alarm clocks allow you to wake up and be your own person for a moment. Uh, say if you're tired a lot during the day, one of the reasons might be that blue light for sleep and there's a uh, there's pretty good research that shows that this messes with our sleep rhythms, trying to wind down an hour or so before bed. There's a whole section of my the earlier parts of this talk where I talk about just the chaos of the YouTube recommendation algorithm and just like turning off YouTube autoplay, which you go into your settings, just turn it off autoplay, turn off uh, autoplay in the browser with that green box on the bottom here, just to watch the videos you need to watch without waking up an hour later and being certain that the earth is flat. Um. I'll, I really go through a whole piece where like I talk about how when I was growing up, if you asked me if I liked certain games or apps, I'd be like, yeah, I love them. But if you ask me, how do they make me feel? That's a different question. The first hour of playing that game, I was exhilarated and it was fun. But the next four hours, I was mostly just like stressed and angry and trying to get to the next level. And so separating out, like, do I use this from how does this make me feel during and after use? Um, and there, yeah, and there are a couple more, but like, uh, that's the, this is the the gist of like kind of best practices and recommendations. And I have a PDF also on the website that I can send you that that goes into some more of these. Um, but those are just some things that teenagers have found helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ariane? <clears throat> yes. Hi, Max. Uh, so I've been hey. talking with a friend of mine who has a teenage daughter, and I let her know I'd, I'd ask this question. Um, she had a friend that she shared an embarrassing video with like a year ago, and then they stopped being friends and this person altered it and put it on social media and it spread and it's caused a lot of distress. Um, and then people that don't even know her are commenting and it's cyberbullying. But um, in, in those situations when um, people that you don't even know or making judgment and taking things out of context and um, how, what, what is a good way to deal with that? And, and you mentioned um, suicide levels and anxiety and at this person's school, um, a number of people committed suicide. So I think um, there is a overall uh, mental health uh, challenge uh, there. It's a very large high school. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's really hard. And it's like, ideally, you could work with the whole community of like to stop dealing with it that way. Like when you are a parent or when there's one individual, um, I think there's a this thing starts to happen where like we sort of become addicted to the pain of it. Like we like checking and like looking at all of the things, feeling like we need to know all the things, all these horrible things that like other people are saying about us or watch every comment on them. And then just sort of question like, 
hey, I know it feels like you need to check that and do that, but like, is that helping? Like, is, do you maybe want to turn it, like, do you maybe want to turn it off and not feed the fire and like, eventually it will die down? Um, but it's, it's so hard and like, it extends outside of the screens too. People will say things in person and the online bullying turns into real bullying. And in schools, I always say like anyone who's saying mean things about someone from behind the screen is probably suffering and deeply insecure and not confident in themselves. And they're trying to put you down to make themselves feel better. And I like try to say that in a pretty intense way, but I know it doesn't solve everything in the moment. And I wish I had better solutions and actions that could be taken for something like that, but it's certainly not uncommon. And, um, and it's tough when it's just like you're dealing with one individual. Thank you. Questions open? Anybody else? Um, I'm putting a PDF of some of those best practices in the chat as well. Thank, you, thank, thank you so much, Max. Uh, th this one might be. Uh, I asked you the question about the about uh, are any of the companies getting better, but I, I also have. If you had to rank companies in terms of their response, right? Are there, uh, is there is there something to to the issues that you have raised us for us today? Um, to rank which companies? The the social media companies and how they're uh, how they're changing. Which are there are there ones you'd consider safe or relatively safe? For I mean, for, for children, there's like some. Uh, like one of the stories of, I can read out loud here from some of the students is like, it's just because of the nature of an algorithm trying to figure out how, like, what will a 13 year old watch? Um, it just all trends towards just like very highly sexualized content very quickly. Oh. Um, there's one story from a teenager that really struck, stuck with me, which was, um, pull it up here. I was 10 when my parents first gave me a tablet. My only form of social media for a while was Pinterest, but I'd quickly been introduced to porn and rape and a lot else. I was pretty much addicted by 11, but by 12, I realized how wrong and gross it was for a kid my age to be thinking and looking at stuff like that. It took a while, but I disciplined myself and I got out of it. I'm 15 now and no one in my life knows it happened. Mm -hmm. um so like you know pinterest is obviously not one that we would think of as like <laughs> as a place where this stuff is going on and as far as they go pinterest i think is way less toxic than most of these apps but just and the nature of these algorithms and kids is just the nature of throwing a lot of different content up against a wall and what is someone likely to click on like that just tends to be very sexualized content and that tends to be a slippery slope especially for like a really young mind and not here to like cast any specific judgments on porn, et cetera, but just it's really bad sex ed. And I think a lot of young people are getting their sex education from pornography. And that's already like shifting a lot about intimacy and, and all of those things. And, and also just like the, the type of content, you know, Andrew Tate being a very popular uh, person right now, you might've heard that name popping around. He's pretty much just like, uh, like hyper, like, over overly masculine dude who is saying like a lot of pretty mixed and misogynistic things and it seems like he's been hurt as a child and now is trying to play all these power games and teach young men to do the same um and just like the type of sort of like simple not long-term healthy but like sounds good and like how do you rile up young boys who are suffering stuff like this is the type of content that rises to the top in a social media ecosystem and um yeah i'm a big fan of can we delay, can we create more time in these kids' lives and more spaces in these kids' lives where that is not the type of social interaction so that when this inevitably comes in, they have a little bit more preparation of what it's like to be a human being. Again, I wish that solved more things, but like that is a place where it seems like there's effectiveness to focus. I've spoken with a lot of parents over the years and I've heard a lot of, I'm so glad I waited to give my kid a smartphone. I have heard maybe one person who said, I wish I gave my kid a smartphone sooner. Um, and it's also like we think talk with again we say phone we don't mean phone phones whatever give our kids phones we want to give our kid a device that like can make calls and like a flip phone or a gab phone it's called fantastic like that's great you can communicate with them we're talking about like 
supercomputers, self-comparison machines, and porn machines. At what age do we want to give our kids supercomputers, self-comparison machines, and porn machines? Um, how developed do they need to be before they have that 24-7? I think that really is the question. It's like an mm -hmm. awkward one because, ooh, like that's a trickier way to think about it. But that is yeah. also the reality. Yeah, the framing of that, I think, is, is so critical that it's no more just a phone. Uh, we have a couple of hands up. Uh, Erica? Thanks so much. Um, you know, this resonates both because I have kids who are, you know, from eight all the way up to 15, but also I teach undergrads. And one of the um, assignments I give them every semester is, you know, to make a personal change in a managing change class. And one that um, tends to come up and increasingly comes up sort of spontaneously by students themselves, not by me, is they all want to spend less time on their phones and especially at night. Um, so any, I, I thoroughly appreciate this, but um, the question I have is actually related to some of the research I do around authenticity. I love what you said, um, that it seems like a lot of companies, especially the, the big ones, maybe, you know, sort of bringing awareness to it, but from more of a PR platform and less about foundational change. So I'm curious when you think about authentic change around this issue, what would you see companies doing beyond the PR stuff? Um, so like picking ones, uh, to like, or let's call it Instagram or Facebook. Like, I think it would look much more like if it, let's pick any kind of metric, if it were because they hit such a wide variety of things, um, with information or like accuracy of information, like what would it look like to be deeply curious about what does it mean to be informed about a topic? And then how do you measure who is like how, when someone is informed about a topic, whether that's like both being able to like very clearly understand and articulate the opposing points of view um, and like defend your own and with like with clarity. And then how, what makes people get there if the goal is like common society and un mutual understanding and democracy, like what is have you ever seen a comment thread like that on political post resolve beautifully where people understand each other better and like I have not um like it's sort of a ridiculous place for political discourse and it's where so much of it is happening you know like when two people do an activity together in real life that is a better environment for having a political discussion where there might be disagreements like what would it look like to be pushing people towards more of that when public conversations are happening it's like those kind of nudges and so it just it would look foundationally different and it's kind of not the product. So I'm, I'm not holding my breath, but I think there's so much that could be done if there were goals that were like, this is what we're trying to do. Like if, what does making the world more open and connected mean? Like giving a little comment box where everybody can yell at each other, I don't think is really making the world more open and connected. I think that's just like this lightweight touch point that can very easily be, um, just make us less, conne <laughs> less connected, they just see the other as an enemy. And so it's like there's so many categories and it would depend on what each of those are. And I could see something like a Facebook or an Instagram addressing lots of them. Um, but I, yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, like what changes would I like to see them make? There, there's so many. Um, and then like among, among kids, I do think like just baseline shifting the eight, like the ages from 13 to like 16 would probably be be helpful just even as like a nudge to parents and to others of um but they're they're not going in that direction they're creating messenger kids and trying to hook them in younger thanks so much thank you uh matthew uh, hi max i uh, really appreciate your approach with the questions um non-judgmental and um not telling them what to do i think that's really really effective um the one thing you mentioned i was wondering if you had uh a list of the strategies or a document that has a strategy that they use to manipulate them uh, or us, I shouldn't say that, us, um, that you that you go to to share with them. I, you know, I like that approach too. Um, if you think you're being taken advantage of, that that's different than um, thinking something. Um, if you go to, uh, let me get this video here. Um, if you go to like the website, we have 
like some of those uh, are like really just, I guess, one video that is just like a helpful conversation starter on this. Let me grab this link. Oh, this is probably going to be a crazy big a drink, a big link because that's how they do this. Um, put that in the chat too. This is just like a nice one um, within Snapchat. Uh, uh, actually, I can share screen and play this. Yeah, okay. Oh, but I didn't do audio because I'm not good at technology. <laughs> Share screen. Hands, give me whole hands if you have Snapchat. If you use Snapchat, give me your whole hands, please. Keep your hands high if you have some kind of streak going, any streaks going. Keep your hands high if you like streaks. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Isn't it wild that so many of us are doing something that we don't actually like doing? So like it, it's one example, and that might have been blurry there, but it's just like asking the kids, like, hey, do you have Snapchat streaks that you're keeping up? Um, and they're all like, yeah. And I was like, do you like Snapchat streaks? And they're like, no. <laughs> um, it's just like one quick, easy example of to be like, so you're doing a thing that you don't like doing because this stuff works on you. Um, and, and yeah, like, and on the website, there's like a longer talk with some of the more, um, specific examples on the front end of that, that you're welcome to use as well. I do things like I show them just like the, the, a picture of the home screen with lots of red notifications on it. And then like, I turn those notifications green and just like notice the difference in your body of like how these red notifications feel red is like alert, urgent, important, must check this. And then you see the green ones and you're like, oh, that's not so bad. Maybe I don't need to check those all the time. Um, and so like just little examples um, like that. And I talk about how uh, like just we found when we were working in tech that automatically playing the next video held more time. And then I talk about the YouTube algorithm of the countdown, the five, four, three, two, one at the end of a YouTube video or at the end of Netflix. And um, how that just does kind of end up keeping us watching longer. Uh, and uh, oh, actually, one that I think is very effective is this screen. Um, I think I use it here. I use a non-Facebook example for parents. But just like, just literally showing this and being like, what's happening here? Like, what are we saying? We're saying, hey, someone just took a picture of you or said something about you to everybody you know, to your whole school. Someone just said something about you to your whole school. Do you want to see what it is? You don't have to. You don't have to click it. Do you want to see what someone just said about you to your whole school? Just like rethinking what some of these notifications are on like a human level, I have found to be like a helpful, like uh, a helpful method. And then um, one more is also just like the uh, play. Um, I talk about slot machines and variable rewards. And how like even the things we love in these apps, it's scroll, scroll, like we're still playing the slot machine of board, board, board. Huh? That made me laugh. Board, board, board. Oh, that turned me on. Board, like even the things we love in these apps. And so given to us inside the slot machine and how hard that can make it to have a healthy relationship with it. Um, but yeah, but those are those are some things. And, and there's a bunch on the website and I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And I really like it. You know, you're trying to get them to notice um stuff and i think as i've taught for 20 years now i realize that that's more important than trying to teach us to notice so i applaud you for that um thank you yeah hope it helps uh jyoti you had your hand up do you do you still have it up sure <laughs> thank you max everything that you've said um you know it is resonates very very deeply two things. One, you said you're very effective because you're not the parent or the teacher telling them. You're speaking to a room full of teachers. And I was looking for what can I take away and do. And I love the example of setting self-reflective exercises to get them to think about what they do, how, why. And that's something I can include as part of the assignments I set in my classroom. So I want to find other ways to amplify your work and have more people doing and saying the kind of things you are saying. And the question, what can we do as you know, teachers to get uh, to amplify this? And the question I have is, 
um, you said something about asking them as to what is a meaningful experience. And you said it's often not social media related. I'm old enough to remember a time before Google was invented. And I find in my experience of asking about meaningful things, there are many people, students that I've encountered who find the online things so much more real and meaningful than they are for me, that I almost have felt a disconnect when I say, well, that stuff is not real because for them, it is very, very real. So if you have any comments around that to say, if it's not meaningful to me, but their meaningfulness comes from the online support group or online other things that mean so much, you know, like the likes, um, what can we say or do to get them to have that clarity of distinction between, you know, a real conversation versus, as you said, comments where everybody's commenting, where it's not really bringing us closer together. Yeah, I mean, I personally, when like we have discussions at the end of every of every talk, and if kids are bringing up examples that they found really meaningful online, like I don't fight them on it. I'm like, great, like great, okay, you have found meaning in an online environment. That's wonderful. Like I get uh, the reason I think it's so important to create more spaces at younger ages of like where this isn't happening is because you can just create. What I do, I agree with you. I believe it's just a much deeper and more foundational sense of meaning and so like i don't think it's helpful to be like well no that's not real for something that people are finding really meaningful themselves um but i think like being like a yes and approach might be helpful of like uh oh yeah like great and like that is wonderful that you have that community online like can you think of examples not online that were like meaningful where you were laughing really hard and um like what was it what does that look like for you um but yeah i like it is like and i think there are teenagers that are finding meaning in these spaces sometimes but like I I certainly have found um yeah like for the young kids some of them after that reflecting exercise are like oh yeah I was kind of just like happier before I had a phone um and they can remember those things at the young ages uh, and for teachers one thing that also I've found is uh, I've heard recently I really liked is teachers will have phone cubbies on the doors and then a lot of teachers, I know you do this, but I talked to one teacher in Canada who took that as his attendance. So you are not present <laughs> if you do not have your phone in a cubby, which I thought was uh, a very clever and poetic um, way of creating that in the classroom. Um, but yeah, and you know, I would also like, I'd be curious, what are the spaces that kids are finding really meaningful? And if it's like, I find social media meaningful, I'm connecting and I'm being an activist, maybe they're finding their sense of purpose on social media um it's just like there's the tricky and tricky question of like are you really making an impact like on social media like are you actually like oh what what have you done to change this are you raising awareness are people actually more aware or are they just seeing like are they seeing what you're saying and rolling their eyes at it are you reaching people what would it look like if you care about this issue what would it look like to really make a difference maybe social media is what you can do and if that's great then if that's what you can do then that's what you can do but is there a way that you could actually more tangibly contribute to this thing that you care about um because i think we're often getting a false sense of catharsis from sharing about the like look i'm being an activist on social media of like post a thing i'm a good guy now as opposed to like what what does it actually look like to if you care about this to make any kind of change in your own life or in others hey. uh ravi yeah, sorry for joining late ahead uh, other meetings, but uh, this is a fascinating topic and thank you, Max, for your, your presentation. I get a gist of it. Uh, uh, but, but I think it would be very helpful if you add this dimension of time as a limited resource for everyone who is living uh, as a very important uh, uh, recognition on part of everybody. Um, by, by saying that it is a zero-sum game, uh, there is a, 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 an individual level uh, self-determination or self-responsibility to choose where you want to spend your time in. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's very important for uh, uh, children to develop this idea of self-responsibility and that they have to really use some 
perhaps guidance from others uh, in terms of how we may make such choices. For example, I'll just relate three criteria. Relevance is the first one. Second one is sense of magnitude. And third one is a balance. So if you are spending some time on any effort or any endeavor, first you have to really ask yourself if, you, if it is really relevant to what you need to do or you want to do. And second one is sense of magnitude. Are you spending too much time there or too less and so forth? And the last one is a sense of balance, which one uh, learns over uh, lived experiences. So that kind of guided guard, guardrails to determine what is optimal for individual behavior would be helpful from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, because you should not have this draconian measures of a complete exclusion uh, because that kind of uh, nips the self-discovery process in the bud. We should let uh, the kids and children blossom at their own pace. But then uh, setting the guardrails, hey, uh, is it relevant? Is it the sense of magnitude and balance? Uh, I think that would be very helpful guidance from uh, you know, practitioners like you to the next generation. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. I would like, if we could actually set like guardrails and a way for this to be like, even just like remotely safe and beneficial for teenagers, I would absolutely love that. It is my understanding presently that like just this, there's so much competition for that limited 24 hours a day that you never get back. And every single one of these companies sees these kids as 10 to 18 year old males and females. And I need more of their time this year than I got last year to keep my shareholders happy. But like, it's just, and with these things, like every notification being someone just said something about you to everybody you know, like, I think to ask young people and frankly, people to just uh, ignore that or self-regulate that, like, I just don't, it doesn't feel realistic to me right now. Like, I would love for, I would love for it to go exactly the approach you're talking about. It just doesn't seem like it's what, uh, it's what kids and families are like able to experience like in practice because the pull is so significant and maybe we just haven't set good enough guardrails or good enough like boundaries or good enough helpers but it really seems like most parents are are saying like yeah creating more time where these kids get to be kids and they get to learn and like grow up as as humans before being introduced where of course they eventually will be introduced to these technologies, they seem to have more like life to reference and more life skills to manage the chaos of that. Um, and yeah, I see your hand up, oh, feel free to I, I, I just respond. wanted to follow up. Uh, as an instructor in my class for a three credit hour class, I tell all my students, if you want to get a, a, an A grade, you have to spend three hours of outside of the class time. And if you cannot allocate three hours of, of your time outside of the class time, then you will not get an A grade. And the assignments in the course syllabus clearly state that requirement of time allocation on your part. So guardrails should not merely be stated, but they have to be enforced in individual realms of action. One realm, realm of action is a course that's being taken by the student. So if you don't spend three hours, then you will not get A grade. So I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like different levels of agency for a college student versus a middle schooler, and I hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, I have one question about uh, uh, the notions of augmented and virtual reality, which is, uh, I know, like our school is thinking of of adopting, so, and I don't even know how, so I don't can't get into the specifics of this, but it's exploring the possibility of adopting this. And it scares me uh, because I think it takes us more and more into this uh, artificial world, if not anything else. And I was just wondering what your experience with it is and whether you have any advice on that. Um. I haven't played very much with augmented reality in terms of virtual reality. Like I would just encourage with both of them, I guess, to not make the mistake we made with so much in education of, oh, these new magical devices. They're definitely just going to enhance learning experience. 
but just flip the expectation of, I'm assuming this will not be helpful to my learning experience. Prove me wrong. And then when you're proven wrong, awesome, cool, a new tool. It's going to be so fun. Yes, you can do this. Look how with wonderful virtual reality program, which I've seen incredible ones, like help people regain the motion of limb, of limbs, the phantom limb sy like syndrome, seeing like these therapy exercises where you go to the perspective of the person you're talking to and it's completely magnificent. You have like environments. I'm sure you can learn physics in way cooler ways if you're inside a virtual reality experience. So when it works and when it's really meaningful on a human level and helping people learn things and grow on a human level, awesome. Let's use it. I would just say, let's be very careful about, well, this is a more engaging way to learn the lesson. Of course, it's going to be more engaging. Like the tech just works at being more engaging. But is this actually helping the kids learn better, like helping them connect with it, like in a significantly deeper way, helping them be the people that we want them to be, like asking those human questions as we integrate the new technologies. And I think starting from the assumption of, I assume this new tool will not help. Show me that I'm wrong and then be awesome. Please be pleasantly surprised when we are wrong and integrate the technology. Any questions, anyone else? We have about three minutes left. So if any burning questions, please. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know how to thank you enough, Max, for, for taking the time and spending the time with us. Uh, I think you can safely say that we'll all be ambassadors for, for the message and the concerns that you have raised. Uh, that's why I think all of us are here and uh, really, really appreciate it. I know you have a very, very busy time and uh, this is so useful uh, that for uh, we, we encounter this all the time. And, uh, you know, when we think about uh, effectiveness of businesses or we think of multiple stakeholders, but Traditionally, children don't occupy a big space in our thinking about this. And this is one area for certain where the impact is deep. It will be long term unless we pay real attention to, to what, what you're talking about. So really, thank you so much for spending this time with us and, and really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And if you, if anyone wants those, like these Harvard resources, just shoot me an email, max at yeah. socialawakening.org and I will pass them to you. Yeah. And what, what if I, uh, if you send them to us and we'll just share them on our website, is that okay? Sure. Uh, okay. The, or we'll share yeah, the link on our website. So, so sure. they, so, or, or in the transcript for this, for this session. Sounds good. Anyone, any nice other final you. comments? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you Mike. so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Ariane. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought that was a great session. <laughs>